So welcome everyone to today's presentation about new uh, architecture to be supported by Valgrind in near future. My name is Ivo Reiser and my colleague Tomáš Jedlička would like to present in 15 minutes. Uh, we both work for Oracle. We were working on Solaris previously, now we work on Linux. So this is just to say whatever I say here, it's uncovered. So um, why Spark? Because it's a cool architecture. And so we started uh, with Solaris, and now we focus more on Linux. <coughs> this is a brief overview of today's uh, presentation. We will divide uh, these parts uh, to Tomáš and me, and the beginning we will just uh, share. So the story of uh, Valgrind uh, Spark um, port uh, begins after the Solaris port was integrated successfully maybe two or three years ago. So we were talking with Tomáš, so Solaris is there, what's next? And the so it's on x86 or i 64 was there, so what's next? So the obvious conclusion was, ah, it's still missing the Spark. So <coughs> because we were working on Solaris, so we started working on uh, Spark uh, on Solaris. Now we joined the Linux club, so we switched uh, to the Linux, but still the Spark is the same. So uh, we expect uh, much quality use uh, from the Spark uh, Solaris port. And we maintain it as two separate forks, but we <coughs> move the code uh, heavily between uh, those two forks. And it's us, and with this I... Whoa, it is forks. So now it's your turn, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. So let's skip this line. So why Spark? Oh, what is Spark? So <laughs> Spark is a scalable processor architecture. The history starts in 80s. It was designed by Sun Microsystems. Today, it is still under development in Sun and Fujitsu. So there is a joint agreement between both companies that it will be developed in a way it is still compatible within each other. So that's why you can run Solaris also on Fujitsu Spark machines. Yeah, uh, as you can see, a Spark hardware these days, it's not a small box. Actually, this was one of the older systems. So if you look, this piece is just a single Spark computer, which hosts like 32 terabytes of physical memory. And I guess this one has like two and a half thousands of hardware strands in it so you can now you can see a cluster of two of them but the expectation is we will get to like 64 terabytes of physical memory and 4000 of hardware strands in a single machine so why the machine needs to be so big well today not not every kind of workload application is designed it scales so well in a like the map reduce style so we still have a lot of applications which use a shared huge memory space that needs to be accessed from multiple threads so this is why the spark is still here and what the customers are expecting from the spark so the first thing we would like to quickly give you some interaction about how the spark architecture works so yeah, it must be quick because of the timing, so it will be just the interesting parts rele relevant for Valgrind. So it is a reduced instruction set architecture. It means it has a just a limited subset of instructions. All of the instructions are fixed sized 32 bits. Uh, it is a load store architecture, so it means uh, regular instruction cannot operate directly on memory. You need to load the data from memory to register first, then you can do whatever you want to and store it back again. 
Also, there are no things like implicit stack support you might be used to from the x86. So there is nothing like push pop in the function prologues. Basically, the stack is implemented by using general purpose registers, and it is up to compiler to manage or handle the stack frames and uh, things like that. Uh, common instruction on Spark has had three operands, so it can be either two input registers or one input register and immediate value. And then there is an output register. So, yeah, this is this is the most common format of instruction you will see. Yeah, the big challenge or, or difference is that the hypervisor, because the Spark machine support virtualization, but in a slightly different way you might be used to. So the hypervisor is actually built inside the firmware of the chip. So uh, we can slice the big machine to smaller chunks. And uh, each CPU is running in non-privileged mode, privileged mode which holds the kernel, and hyper-privileged mode, which means it actually is inside of the hypervisor handling. Why it is important for Logrint, it means the hypervisor is still there, and it takes care of some of things like interrupt deliveries all the time. And you will see it causes our some issues for a user land debugging because it's it's firmware, so you can update it, and it can alter the behavior of some of the functions of the chip. So, how it looks like from the point of view of the register set. So, Spark has a uh, general purpose. It has a 24 general purpose registers. I will have another picture which are alias into the input ones, output ones, and the local ones. Um, we'll probably see it on the next picture. It serves for emulating a function call, so we have something like input arguments, output arguments for the next function call, and the else are representing a local variables in a function. But beyond that, there is a lot of more other, there are like G, like really global registers, there are floating point registers, there are something called ancillary state registers, which is technically other, other kind of registers for other usage. And yeah, I will now peek to the next slide, try to explain more about what the I's, L's, and O's are. So from x86, you probably are used that the stuff is being pushed to the stack directly. Uh, what the Spark architecture has is it has a many more registers than the number which is accessible at any single moment for the chip. So this is called a register window. So the I's, O's, and locals <coughs> technically compose a single register window which represents a single frame on the stack or function execution. So whenever you call another function from, <laughs> from the caller, you will see that the CPU can allocate another window. So it will basically select a different internal registers and then perform translation of the I's, O's, L's to the new window. And you can see that there is an overlap, which means whatever you have put in the O registers are output arguments of your function. So after you call a function which will ask for a new window, the O's will automatically become ints. So in the next function, it will be in the I registers. I hope, does it make sense? Like, yeah. So the operation is called the save restore. So whenever you save, you are going to allocate a new window. If you call restore, you are basically freeing the window, <laughs> unwinding the mechanism back. The issue here is that this is all happening inside the chip. So you cannot observe this behavior on the stack unless when the kernel or the debugger explicitly dumps the data to the stack, or if you arrive to a place where you basically allocated all of the windows, so there is no other place for the next function call. At that point, a CPU will issue some spill fill traps asking the system to actually dump the windows somewhere to the memory and then either or reload them back as necessary. So, after you fill all the eight or seven, seven windows, you will start seeing the old ones being pushed to the stack available for the debugging software. So yeah, this is quite tricky. And especially for Walgreens, it gives us a lot of headache to try to emulate this behavior on the guest state. 
yeah, you can see the globals are always the same. So they are not affected by the window switching mechanism. Yeah, floating point registers, there is a bunch of floating points sized from 32, 64 bits and up to 128 bits, uh, but they overlap. So like a double precision register is actually two adjacent floating point registers of of 32-bit precision and, and so on. So this is another thing people should be talking about slightly. Yeah, so this is about the register set. So next highlight of the Spark architecture is the control transfer. Spark is using a delayed control transfer. So it means whenever you branch to some different place, we are still able to execute one instruction after the branch before we get directed to new destination. So there is an example. You can see the branching works. For example, here we are branching based on condition codes. There are registers which holds the condition codes for us. And there is the destination. So technically, this instruction is sitting in the branch delay slot and will be executed before the instruction at the new address. So. This is part of the problem. Second part of the problem is you may have an annual bit here which says, but if we actually haven't branched, please discard the instruction in the delay slot. Because we are in a, on a, running on a RISC CPU, so it is, everything is out of order inside the chip. So <laughs> this instruction may have been prepared, but not committed yet. And in case we didn't decide to jump, we need to discard this in the inside CPU buffers. <laughs> so. Practical usage, for example, a compiler can put first instruction of the destination here and just said, but if we haven't jumped, discard it because I have preemptively executed something from the destination. That's right. So, yeah, as you can see, this is managed by having two program counters. This is another difference from <laughs> a regular architecture. So you have a program counter which points to an instruction you are actually executing, and you have a program counter which is pointing to instruction you will be executing after this instruction. <laughs> so technically, it's always plus four because we have a fixed size. But in case of the jump, you will see that the program counter will be pointing to the branch instruction, and the next program counter will be the branch delay slope. After we execute the branching instruction, we will move to the next program counter, but we said that the next program counter will be at the address. So basically, the transfer is handled by, by the two registers. And again, this is something which is not easily supported in Valgrind, because there is no way or, or easy representation for this scenario. So yeah. <laughs> Another, another nice thing about the Spark is uh, whenever you try to load or store something from and to memory, we use a 64-bit address space, virtual addresses. But we also have something called address space identifier, which is a 8 bits, 8 bits additional information telling the MMU how to alter the load and store so it can do something different. So some of the ASIs are designed for uh, privilege or hyperprivileged mode only, but some of them are accessible from user space, which basically means you can ask the MMU, for example, to load data from memory, but switch NDNS. So the MMU will access the address in argument, but return you the reversed value in the register. So there are also other groups of ASI, so some of them are calling and translating, which means we will involve MMU and use the address as a virtual one. Some of them are non-translating, non which means they can reference a physical address. And there are, of course, a special ASI, which allows us, for example, to address something which is not tied to address space like a registers. So, for example, Spark chip has more registers as a scratch space, so we can use ASI's to play with eight extra registers if you need to have some spare place. Or, for, for example, Hypervisor can provide you special ASI for, I know, for performance counters. So whenever you read something from a memory address with that ASI, you actually invoke a routine in Hypervisor which will fill in the data for you, check whether you have a permissions and so on. So <laughs> yeah, you can see the, the instruction itself is not different from a load store or regular load store, but can have an ASI in its 
in its opcode, which means it, if, if this is it, it's compiled in ASI. So we just say, do this load and use this constant. But to be more <laughs> dynamic, you can also say just load from this address, but use whatever is in the ASI register of the CPU. So you can dynamically change what the current ASI will be by writing to the ASI register. So <laughs> only at the runtime you know dynamically what actually this will do. Because, for example, there's a good example. This is something load, load, float from memory, which will load eight bytes by default. Yeah, by default mean there is nothing like this in the instruction. This, is, this works because a CPU has a, some notion of the default ASIs. So whenever, if you omit everything, we will use one of the default values, which is dis described in the documentation. But you can see whenever you put a different ASI to the instruction, it changes the behavior of the instruction, how many bytes it loads. Also, there are things like block stores and block loads, which will, for example, read 64 bytes from memory instead of 64 bits, and so on. So, yeah, this is basically the problem we have in, at VEX, that if it is not written there yet, we have a quite a hard time to do some compile time translation of this other space. And also, we have a big problem for in the memory tools, because the tools doesn't know nothing about what the ASI means. Some of them are even vendor specific, so they can be different <laughs> between <laughs> the implementation on Spark with different vendors. So, yeah, OpenSSL and other things can use it. Crypto instructions, Spark has a lot of crypto instructions built in the CPU. So, they are, for example, using some special SI to, to do the stuff. Okay. Yeah, this is a new feature of the new Spark CPUs, the ADI. Uh, the logic is we are trying to detect memory issues in the code in the real time on the running chip. So what we do, we are actually using uh, unused bits in a 64-bit memory address. So we can put a color on a pointer. The pointer is stored in the cache line and later in, in the memory the module. And on each access, we are checking whether the color is still in match. So a CPU will issue a fault whenever there is a mismatch between the colors. And that way, we, for example, can put uh, buffer boundaries by coloring different things in before and after, after the buffer and detect them on runtime. However, it's cache aligned, so it works for 64 bits. It, you cannot create a smaller chunk or smaller piece of memory. Yeah, usually for a user process we deliver a, a asynchronous signal to signal that the ASI has been messed up and it can be handled somehow. It depends on the tool. Yeah. I would say last thing because on Spark, whenever you do a syscall you need to have a mechanism to enter the kernel somehow. It used to be by issuing an interrupt. Now we use a syscall, sysenter instructions. Spark is still using the trap. However, Spark has a hardware support for traps. So we, each time you trap, the context will change slightly in the CPU. So you have a, some fixed amount of nested traps you can create. So for that reason, if you do a syscall, it will jump or push the CPU to different trap level. So we need to f move it back to trap level zero in kernel. We need to find a syscall do the stuff, a lot of instructions and some work. So we use something called fast traps on Solaris, which basically allows us to create a syscall which is directly handled in the trap level context. So it's used for some really high speed stuff like getting timers or, or something out of your process. So instead of doing this mechanism, we just directly trap and at the trap leveling, level handling code, we handle everything and return back to the client, sometimes even without switching to privilege mode because it's not required. So this is also a big problem for, for us at the, at the tool level because we need to handle them differently. Yeah. So now. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Tomáš, for uh, introducing us uh, interesting aspects of um, <coughs> Spark architecture. And now I'd like to um, tell you quickly what parts of Vagrant uh, are affected by uh, the Spark support. So this is my picture, so don't blame me. Uh, <coughs> The most uh, interesting part is, of course, uh, done in VEX because we need to provide um, a front end which, uh, <coughs> this, which does this, this, this translation from binary to intermediate representation. And uh, we also need, needed to provide um, instruction selector and emitter to go from uh, IR to back to <coughs> assembly. So, and then there is a whole bunch of uh, core grind uh, modules which needed to be hacked somehow. Uh, some, some of them uh, slight, slightly, some of them quite heavily to uh, support uh, Spark on uh, Solaris or, Lin or Linux. Then there is uh, GDB <coughs> support which works over the GDB remote protocol. We had to uh, s provide um, support for this uh, in GDB because it was not there and for the tools themselves uh, there was not so much work required only some work in memcheck to support uh, some kind of some more um, IOPS not, not, uh, not that much so this is our <coughs> guest uh, layout so you can see uh, globals, um, outputs, locals, and input registers, as Tomáš mentioned. Then there is a whole bunch of uh, floating point registers, some ancillary state registers, and then there is um, support for lazy evaluation of uh, condition codes, uh, registers for integer and uh, floating point. So you can see we didn't uh, emulate all the register windows. Like Tomáš uh, described here, we emulate just a, a single one. Why? Because um, all the Valgrind machinery expects um, a stack pointer to be just an offset in the guest state. And because the stack pointer moves, uh, stack pointer is one of these uh, registers. And because stack pointer constantly moves uh, in these register windows, so we cannot say, oh, this is the stack pointer, because it always changes. Also, uh, uh, one of the reasons is uh, uh, the user space program has no visibility in the other windows. It just uh, <coughs> sees one. And also, um, for um, other Solaris, uh, I, I mean, other OS specific uh, problems, we need to synchronize um, um, the guest state to, to stack, uh, to, to spill the, the register window. And it was very difficult to achieve it uh, if we had uh, all the windows. So we, we, we simulate only one register window and we do immediate fill or spill based on uh, how do we <coughs> encounter uh, safe and restore instructions. So, and we have also some uh, scratch pad here which we use uh, for loading and storing uh, some of the ancillary state registers if they do not support uh, moving between registers but they uh, they also support moving between memory and register so that was uh, register window support instructions in branch delay slots need to be simulated carefully because of the annulling uh, bit so we have a kind of um, <coughs> branching code which the front-end uh, emitter uh, front, front end generates. This, uh, this, this is simulated based on uh, other architectures. They do it similarly. They lazy evaluate the condition codes. This problem Tomáš mentioned if there is um, I see, uh, um, I see in um, the register then we have no way how to tell at the translation time what the instru instruction actually does. So this problem is still not solved. 
we have just worked around it a bit. Also because memcheck um, <coughs> uh, does uh, the shadow operation on uh, uh, 16 byte, uh, byte um, floating point registers, so it uh, converts them to integer operations, so we had to provide some basic emulation of uh, uh, those white re integer registers uh, in the instruction selection. We, all go, we also get, um, like in, on the MIPS platform, we had uh, hundreds of um, warnings from the compiler because of the misaligned uh, access. And we have problem how to efficiently represent um, fast traps, which return uh, up to five return values. So it's still to be solved. And we also um, evaluated possibility if Valgrind can leverage application data integrity somehow to check the addressability aspect of, uh, of, the, of the program. Also, uh, because um, load and store can be um, decorated with uh, different ACIs, we have to <coughs> we had to um, uh, put new attribute here in um, for the load and store operations. It's still questionable if this is the right way to go. I don't know. Basically, it means that all the tools uh, which uh, somehow instrument load and st loads and stores will need to be taught about uh, new um, um, new things. For example, uh, this uh, specific is, uh, <coughs> address space identifier says, "Okay, you perform the load or store, but do not fault if uh, there is a problem with addressability." So we will need to teach them check about it. And it is still not clear how. <coughs> so there are still lots of open questions and problems to solve. And I hope to facilitate some uh, discussion about uh, these problems at this uh, meeting. And the current status of the Solaris and <coughs> Linux uh, ports are, we have been working on a Solaris port uh, on Spark for two years, so it's quite quite mature. <coughs> so Memcheck basically works, the other tools somehow, um, and this this month we have uh, started a uh, port for uh, Spark on Linux, so at this point just builds, nothing else, and <laughs> that's it. Both ports live at this, um, at, this at, 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 at this moment. They live at this address on the packet uh, repo under different branches. And I think that's it. So now we take uh, questions and answers, if there are any. I know, I know, there is support for uh, get index and put index. Yeah. We have considered it and we have, first we had this prototype with uh, get i and put i, but it didn't work because, because there is no way how to get the current index from the user space. You, you, do not, you have no visibility which, which uh, uh, window you are in. I would like to say there are additional registers which are supposed to be those people for the window mechanism. So yeah. there is a current window pointer, what windows we can save, restore, which or how many windows belong to different other space because you definitely don't want to pass kernel stuff to the user land. So but those of them are usually privileged access only. Yes, so yes. the kernel can access switch a window, read whatever it does, but it's not possible to do it on user space except calling many saves and those just the system to dump the stuff on stack. So we had, we had no way how to tell which window it, it was, and we, lo we, we, we got lost. So, so that means you just simulate one window and you do a spill and restore exactly. every function call. 
Yes, yes. Yes, it is exp expensive because uh, here the safe entry stores, the pushing window there and there, is very cheap because it just uh, switches uh, between the internal registers. The only expensive way is when uh, you encounter a fill or spill trap. But now we and, uh, do fill and spill immediately, every, every single uh, uh, push or uh, fill or spill. So uh, it's <coughs> kind of unfortunate, but we were forced this way. So for this reason and also for uh, the problems, for the problems because uh, there are two program counters, so the current port is quite slow. I haven't I haven't uh, done any comparison, but when I run uh, some something on x86 and on Spark, it's quite slow. So uh, some uh, performance optimization needs to be performed first. So, like, any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for, for the address space uh, identifier, <coughs> when uh, uh, you, you, you said uh, uh, some of them are uh, custom or? Vendor specific. Vendor specific? Mm -hmm. but what can programs rely on? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, can we take a slightly different rule compared to say this say, because it makes it because it's only compliance, but that it's all that is like an extension to the architecture. On Spark, we have a Spark V9, which is a top level common definition. Then you have a multiple platform, some for U, some for V, some for R, I guess, and some for M. And then you have a specific chip specifically by the vendors. So at the top level is the only common thing you have. So ASI and Spark V9 standard will be the common one for every vendor. But as you travel the down the architecture, you may say, but if I know I'm running on some for v there will be two additional ASIs I can rely on. And if you need to know this if you are developing the software. But most of the ASIs are truly, because the ASIs, the lower hull is privileged only. So it's meant to be used by the kernel level person. And even the sub portion is just for the hardware. So there is not so much ASIs. I don't know, it's like plenty of them. Oh, could be. Or user land available, which will not cause a privileged stuff, so you can use them. So, but, but can't you then uh, open a cell, for example, will probably check all the hardware at once? So, so open a cell, will mm -hmm. check uh, which processor is running on. Ah, they are they are using uh, the standard ones, which are defined in uh, Spark V9. So they, they, the the standard standard ones sh uh, should be supported by all the, all the vendors. Oh, okay. So okay. they are, they are safe. Also, but uh, also we have uh, something also large with something like capabilities for symbols. So whenever you link the stuff, you can just say I have a special version for this kind of CPU architecture, and the link will be the most optimized way from the binary. So during the link time, you can actually link inside. Help special code doing something different but it is developed by us so we know what we do. Yeah. Like you can switch MEMP CPI version to something more optimized for a given architecture and so let's just pick the function for you. So it's like a Actually, it's not Linux should get the power capabilities in the auxiliary vector from the kernel. Yeah, okay, so but, but then can't you just <coughs> strip everything out of there on the MLA day? Very basic without any extra things yeah. This is what the she's doing. We actually replace the memcheck and stuff with that version, which doesn't. We preload some functions to the yes. binary to avoid this stuff. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's the workaround currently for now. Uh, but. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So we dodged and it's <laughs> a different. So that's, that's the workaround. Just avoid this stuff until we can solve it. But I, I fear the proper solution would be if we ever encounter a uh, write to this register, so we will probably basically uh, end the basic block and <coughs> and uh, then uh, this will be this this block uh, will be translated by vex we need to check uh, the current uh, register value with the expected one and provide the proper translation 
and have the ability to choose between different translations of the, of the same basic block. Yeah, but that's the kind of thing that you earlier Exactly. Yes, you have exactly. translations which have assumptions about the exactly. state of which the machine is so translated. That's probably the, the, the solution here, oh, yeah. but it will be... That's a massive architectural change. <laughs> exactly. Because all the uh, translation uh, caches and that stuff is now uh, assumes there's just one basic block uh, translation. And so how many different ASI values can there be? 256? Yeah, it's 8 bits. 8 bits. It's just a half like 128. Mm. Just <laughs> <laughs> But all the, all, the, all the different instructions have uh, a limited set of uh, um, uh, identifiers, maybe 20 for every, every instruction. So it's most of them are changing the scope of the whole line. Mm. If you want to zero memory, you would have to repeatedly write 64 bits to memory to get the chance zero. But you can write just one instruction and the SI does wipe out like the 64 bytes of the continuous memory after this pointer. So this is just this is a most of the SIs I have seen do this stuff like the mm. blocking operations instead of a small small chunk. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. I don't know why they chose this this way because hard to say. Maybe they are running out of um, opcode space. It was a cool idea at the beginning, but it's been abused terribly. It's like the delay slot idea. It's a cool idea. It like was. Before. Yeah, before and they just systems. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah but now right. it's now it's legacy, and it's we have to deal with it. But but no one is happy about uh, register yeah. windows and delay slot. It's. Legacy in the architecture. So, you, you need to let it was part of that. What happens is part of it. I don't know. Okay. Okay, and the other one. Any question? Uh, yeah. <coughs> how, how usable is the Linux port actually already? So, would it actually, if I, if I took the patch and put it in the Debian package, would no, 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 no. You are too, uh, too, too far ahead. <laughs> there is no package uh, yet. There is just... Um, no, I mean, I, I could take, right, we have currently have a patch, right, that is basically, that would be on top of the upstream right. version yeah. and it would add something. So yeah, so, so you... I'm wondering how usable that something <laughs> is. And could already give it to some... Good question. Great. Ask in a few months. Just now it builds. That's, that's it. Okay. That's it. Have you not tried to run it at all? Um, we have tried, but uh, there are still, so still just the unimplemented part. functionality, you know, and uh, things which break uh, for some reason, and you need, you need to investigate. So, <coughs> yeah, it's at the beginning. The solar port is quite quite ready. I have tried some complex programs and all the Cisco inter interfaces and um, uh, the pro other problems are either solved or uh, work around, so it runs. Gives you some expected uh, um, outputs. So, so how big a program can you run on the slides block? Can you run it in an office? Yeah, much more complex ones. Maybe like on the storage servers, they take gigabytes of, uh, of memory, but just code and other gigabytes of of uh, other data. So is this stuff getting used internally inside Oracle to find bugs? Or you can't tell me the answer to that? Sorry? Is this is it <laughs> is it getting used internally inside Oracle to find bugs? It is, it or is. You cannot tell me the answer. So uh, the x86 uh, port on Solaris is used heavily internally and I have reports from people they found it very useful, like in the Linux community. The Spark port is not so widely known, so I don't know. I don't know that. The problem is you need to have a Spark, and it's not so easy to see exactly how they talk. Yes. Okay. Has there been any interest in the Illumos community? Ah, good question. I think Illumos runs only on x86. There is. Uh, some spark support um, on one distribution and there's patches uh, variant called 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I was in contact with some uh, Illumos maintainers who who are running regression tests on x86, and they package it in, in some distributions. I don't know about uh, Illumos on Spark. So. Okay. It's based on the latest public standards, I guess. Like yes, the, yes, yes. We have a Oracle Spark architecture document, which are extensions to the Spark V9, so it's like based on 2015, I guess. Mm -hmm. There is maybe 2017, probably, I don't know, but I'm not sure about this. Yeah. But we base uh, it on 2015, which, is, which corresponds to M M7 or T7. <coughs> uh, So this is a Spark uh, Spark feature. So uh, it can be enabled on Linux. I don't know what's the state of uh, current state of uh, how to enable it in Linux. But this feature needs to be enabled first, and it needs to have a support from the memory allocator, such as uh, malloc in libc. So you basically tell somehow to enable this feature for this current uh, program, and the allocator behaves uh, slightly differently. Instead of uh, just returning pointers like it used to before, it now returns uh, colored pointers. So the topmost four bits contain the, the, the version or the color. And <coughs> I don't know if uh, the um, allocator in uh, Linux libc is capable of, of that. Or Not it's yet. But okay. The okay. kernel bits are being submitted upstream right now. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. So they will land upstream very soon. And now we are working to have support in glibc as well and also in GDP. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get you know, a nice message. So yeah. instead, okay. of, instead of getting a panic. <laughs> <it's>, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. One thing about Spark is that x86 has some debugging support. Cache line, sixty-four bytes. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and basically, it, uh, for small buffers, it, it's it's way too big. So they they use clever technique because you are usually interested in buffer overflows. So they position buffer at the end of the cache line. So uh, they, you can detect uh, the end of the buffer right. Let me repeat the question because it was not clear here, here quite a lot. So the question was about if we can cheat and do not uh, simulate or emulate the program counter and next program counter uh, exactly like the processor does. I, I think it's, well, you cannot simply write the program counter on Spark because I, the next program counter is not even writer but it's just read only. So you need to issue a branching instruction or something like this to actually write something to the next program counter. So you will have to do this uh, on the back side. But I think at this moment there is no such check which will be regarding the VEX to not do something, something malicious. So probably you will f if you try hard, you will find some way how to cheat the program counters from the VEX and, and IR. 
said, you, then you have to pack the, the block disassembly logic so that when it sees a branch instruction, then it has to also pick up the yeah. instruction afterwards and put the NVIDIA representation before it or something? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. We have to exactly. basically unwind the delay of your disassembly phase and the order instruction. So if we know it's only going to be executed, will we revert the order into the disassembly? So we will put the delay slot in front of the branch and then issue the exits, or we do stuff like site exit is here or jump over the exit for the unknown bit. So part of it is just about changing the disassembly logic, but the unknown bit requires some complex mm. So it sounds like it would be helped if you had a Flexible that would be helpful. Mipsport does quite the same thing because they have also delay slot, but but they do not have uh, an null an bit, so they have uh, easier situation. Okay, someone else. We have still two minutes, maybe. Okay, we are done. Yeah. So thank you for your attention and happy Valkyrie Day.